so hello everyone and welcome back to some more of the Dragon Age Origins here in the epilogue basically when everything has already otherwise been done I like uh, the way <laughs> next we are gonna be playing indeed through the um, Darkspawn Chronicles but this episode I thought that will be a little bit of a chat first and then reading some more of the codex entries because there's so many that we didn't read indeed after that we go to darkspawn chronicles and then to awakening also uh i otherwise don't basically know anything about awakening other than ruska can be our main character in awakening which of course will be the case now because she is alive uh, rather than any of the other ones that i've ever played with <laughs> previously and um, I know that she can have some equipment with her to the next awakening from here. I don't know what things, which things she cannot. But I still went and picked up the things that we had stored in the one location on the north. Into the storage box, I went and picked them all up into here. So pff, well, I'll get what I get into the next place and we'll see about it. Also, the only thing that I unequipped from my companions is this life giver ring from Alistair. Because I think that that's at least an extremely good ring. That we even bought so recently that I'll unequip that from Alistair. But yeah, everything else uh, I will let uh, them keep to themselves. But okay, then to the indeed no current quests at all, which is a very strange notion. But let's just go and start reading some codexes. Uh, first and foremost, I thought that now that we defeated the Blight, we could read about the first Blight. Because we got even all of those chapters, sadly we are missing some things. But at least the Blight, first Blight, we have everything off. So, let's read. Tinas is a land of fierce diversity, from the assassin princes of Antiva to the faded griffins of, Ant of the Underfells. But in my travels I have found one tale that unites the people of this land. It is a story of pride and damnation, and although the telling differs, the essence of the tale remains the same. At the heights of its power, the Tevinter Imperium stretched over much of Tinas, uniting the known world under the rule of the tyrannical magisters. It is said that the old gods whom the Magisters worshipped gave them the knowledge of blood magic, and the Magisters used this forbidden power to cement their rule. The blood of elven slaves and humans alike run down imperial altars to fuel Magisters' creed, the tales of their excess so horrifying that one can only be grateful that blood magic is propitiated profi <laughs> today. I can't say that word very well. But all that stands tall must eventually fall. Perhaps they foresaw their ruin, or perhaps their pride knew no bounds. But of whatever the reason, the Magisters dare to open a magical portal into the Golden City, at the heart of the Fade. They sought to usurp the Maker's throne, long left unattended in the Golden City, after the Maker turned his back on his creations. They would storm heaven itself with their power and become as gods. This is what the Chantry, in its oft-exercised tendency to understate, refers to as the second sin. According to most versions of the tale, the Magisters did indeed reach the Golden City and walked into the home of the Maker, where no living being before them had dared or been able to tread. But humanity is not meant to walk in heaven. The Magisters were wicked with pride and other sins and their presence stained at the Golden City. What once was a perfect holy citadel became a twisted home of darkness and nightmares. The Magisters were expelled back through their gateway and cursed for their treachery. As the Golden City had been tainted, so were the Magisters twisted and transformed into things of darkness, the very first of the Darkspawn. The Golden City, once shining beacon at the heart of the Fade, became the Black City, a reminder of all that man's pride has cost. Then chapter 2. People today have little concept of the consequences of the second sin. Oh, believe me when I say that when asked, pious Shantricoin folk will curse the use of foul magic, spitting and snapping their fingers, but none live today who actually remember the horror that was unleashed so very long ago. Whatever records might have existed regrettably did not survive the chaos and ignorance that was to follow. We have only the tales of survivors handed down through the murky ages, the dogma of the Chantry to instruct us, 
and that is precious little indeed. I believe I am not understating when I say that the second scene unleashed the bane of all life upon Titas. The darkspawn are more virulent than the worst plague, a heartless force of nature that came into our world like, a in, like an ill will, wind even. We know from accounts of later plights, as these darkspawn invasions came to be called, never has a more appropriate name existed, that the darkspawn spread disease and famine wherever they tread. The earth itself is corrupted by their presence, and the sky roiling with angry black clouds. I do not exaggerate, my friends, when I say that the mass scattering of darkspawn is an omen of threat cataclysm. It is said that those cursed magisters who became the first darkspawn scratched at the very earth to find solace in the darkness of the dwarven deep roads, and there in the shadows they multiplied, whether by intelligent design or by some last vestige of worship in their minds, they attempted to locate the old gods they had once served. They found what they sought, Dumat, first amongst the old gods, once known as the Dracon of Silence before the Maker imprisoned him and all his brethren beneath the earth for the first sin, usurping the Maker's place in mankind's heart. The slumbering Dracon awoke, freed from the Maker's prison by his twisted followers, and became corrupted himself. Dumat was transformed into the first archdemon, his great and terrible power given will by a rotting, unholy mind. With the dark spawn horde following, Dumat rose and took wing in disguise once again, bringing ruin to the world the Maker had created. The old god had become the eye of a dark storm that would ravage the entire world. Then chapter 3. The world during the first blight was different from the world we know today. Aside from the civilized rule of the Imperium, humans as a race were largely barbarous and splintered, divided into clans and tribes and squabbling amongst ourselves or for resources. At the same time, deep beneath Tidusk's great mountain ranges spanned a dwarven culture as organized and advanced as our own primitive. As was our as, <laughs> as ours was primitive. Yeah. Dwarves had so much more back in the day before the darkspawn, and uh, humans used to be very primitive. Other than the, of course, Imperium. As the darkspawn bubbled up to the surface from their underground lairs, mankind first buckled and then fought back. The armies of the winter attempted to face down the multitudes of twisted creatures and the horrid rotting of the land around them, but they could not be everywhere at once. Human history remembers the first blight as a time of terrible devastation, and those stories are accurate. But in our arrogance, we often forget the price paid by the dwarves in their isolated mountain kingdoms. Yeah, considering that they had a huge advanced kingdom, they did lose a huge deal, for our certainty. The dwarves faced far greater hordes than humanity as the darkspawn challenged them for control, of the underground. Despite the might and technology the dwarves brought to bear, the savage darkspawn tore through them, first destroying the more remote tykes before swallowing up entire kingdoms. Think of it, an entire civilization lost in a space of decades. Compared to the near genocide that the dwarves faced, what we humans call the first blight must have seemed a mere skirmish. Against the darkspawn, the dwarven lands have always borne the brunt of the fighting and the majority of the sacrifices. Four dwarven kingdoms finally managed to combine their might and fight back, and that cooperation saved them. But for the rest of their lands, it was too late. The darkspawn had taken the deep roads to majestic underground passages that linked the dwarven lands throughout Tidas. The darkspawn could now attack anywhere on the surface through these tunnels. Humanity simply was not prepared for such an onslaught. It was clear that the farfare we knew would not avail us. We need to find a new way to fight. Thus came our salvation. The Grey Wartons were born. Indeed. Wounded at Weishaupt Fortress in the Underfells, the Grey Wartons offered humanity hope in its darkest hour. Veterans of decades of battles with the Darkspawn came together, and the best amongst them pledged to do whatever was necessary to stem the tide of darkness that swept across the land. 
these great humans, elves and dwarves pooled their knowledge of the enemy and formed a united front to put stop to the archdemon's rampage. And stop it they did. Ballads are still sung today of the first Grey Warden's charge into the waves of Darkspawn at the city of Nordbotten, each Warden facing 10 or 20 Darkspawn at a time. Squadrons of Grey Wardens mounted on their mighty griffins soaring through the blackened skies and battling the terrible Archdemon with spear and spell. Oh, what a sight it must have been! Incredibly, the Grey Wardens won that first battle. They raised their arms in victory, and suddenly there was hope. The Grey Wardens let, and let the lands of men and the last stalwart defenders of the Dwarven Halls against the hordes of the Archdemon to Mott for the next hundred years, gaining and losing crown, but never backing away. From all over Tidas, they recruited whoever possessed the skill and strength to raise the Grey Wardens' banner, making no distinction between elven slave or human nobleman. And finally, nearly two centuries after the first old god rose from the earth, the Grey Wardens assembled the armies of men and dwarves at the Battle of Silent Fields. It was then that the Dumat finally fell and the first blight ended. The Devinter Imperium would face a new challenge with the with the coming of the prophet Antraste. Though the blight grew distant, thoughts of the blight grew distant, with Dumat's defeat the Darkspawn were no longer considered a threat. But with the wisdom of hindsight we know that conceit proved foolish indeed. The task of the Grey Wardens was far from over. Yeah, because there's more than just the one old god, so yeah, they can be found more of them. It's interesting as us that the first one was the silence. Silence. Wasn't very silent though, I'd say. <sighs> let's see, what is the next one? Sure, let's read about the legend of Kalenhart. We have all of those two, and it's a longer story. Prior to the crowning of King Kalenhart, Ferelden was little more than a collection of independent Arlings and Terranins that warred on each other's constantly over petty matters. Galenhat was born in 510 Exaldas as the third son of the High Ever Merchant on the Hard Times. He was eventually sent to a distant cousin, to a distant cousin, a poor young knight named Sir Foranan, who made Galenhat his squire and dog handler. As the tale goes, Sir Foranan and his squire became caught up in one of the wars of unity at the time. Al Murdidin, Murdin, I guess, yeah. Al Murdin was a strong but gener generally disliked man who was making a bid for kingship. For Annan's own lord, a young fool of an Arl named Ter Tenador, Tenedor, no older than Kalenhard, was besieged by Murdin. Mur Din's forces at his castle, today known as West Hill. When Murtin called Tenedor out to parley, the young all asked for a volunteer from amongst the squires, someone who could masquerade as Tenedor in the parley party. Kalenhat kneeled before Tenedor and asked for the honor. Much to Tenedor's answer, for Anna's dismay, Kalenhat immediately identified himself to Arl Murtin. When asked by the Arl why he was here, Kalent had explained that he had been asked to take the place of his lord. And the Arl said that he had planned to kill Tenedor. Was Kalent had willing to die in his lord's place as well? Kalent had impressed Myr Myrtin and his allies by saying that he was. Myrtin offered Kalent had a place as his own squire, but Kalent had refused, stating that if Myrtin had planned on betraying the right of parley, he was no man of honor. Myrtin's allies laughed at that, and Myrtin himself conceded that Kalenhad had a point. He allowed Kalenhad to return to the castle safely and launched his final assault. During the assault, both Denedor and Foranan were killed, but Kalenhad found himself in one-on-one -on -one combat with all Myrtin. In front of all of Myrtin's allies, Kalenhad defeated the all and commanded he call, comm commanded he call of his armies. And they all asked Kalenhat who he professed to serve now if both his knights and his lord were dead. To which Kalenhat replied that he would do as his honor bade him do, for he had nothing else. You are not a man known for your honor, Kalenhat said, but I believe you wish to be. 
You allowed me to live once, and so now I do the same for you. Perhaps if more of our people lived by honor, we would learn to trust each other long enough to live together. And with that, Galenhut withdrew his sword. I am humbled by your words, Almurdin told Galenhut, dropping to one knee. To his allies he shouted that he now knew he would never be king, but he knew who should be. With that, Murtin pledged allegiance to Kalenhat, whom he named Tern and ruler of Tenedor's lands. Interesting, 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 cool story. With the allegiance of all Murtin, Kalenhat began his rise to greatness. Some of Murtin's allies also pledged allegiance, but most thought him foolhardy. A boy, commoner, was to lead them to become an and <laughs> was to lead them and become king. Over the years that followed, however, Kalenhat would prove himself worthy of Murtin's trust. With each victory he won over more men to his command, and his reputation as a man of honor spread. Eventually, during his campaign against the lowland Panorn, he met his most infamous friend and companion, the honored warrior Lady Shaina. Kalenhat married the famously beautiful daughter of Murtin, Marin, and his firm belief in the ways of the Chantry became the staple of his court. In a time when the Chantry was still new to the lands and courts following Antraste held the majority of the power in Ferelden. Kalenhan began to solidify the nation as one, in line with the other nations around it. This piety eventually won over to Kalenhat won over to Kalenhat those faithful in Ferelden who had been waiting for such a leader. With Lady Shaina at his side, Kalenhat was unstoppable, and by 542 exiled at the war for Verelden had come down to one final battle against the collected forces of Simeon, Tyrn of Denerim, and the most potent nobleman in the land. Kalenhat persuaded the Circle of Machai to come to his aid, as well as the Ash Warriors, and in the Battle of White Valley, he famously defeated Tyrn Simeon and united the nation. During the battle, Simeon nearly killed Kalenhat, but Lady Shaina intervened and took the wound for him, slaying Simeon. Kalenhat was crowned king in Ter Denerim that year, with Marin his queen, but he spent much of the months that followed nursing Lady Shaina back to health. King Kalenhat's Vereldon was peaceful for a time, with the chantry spreading quickly under the king's guidance. Everywhere the king and queen went, they were surrounded by shearing crowds. The common folk celebrated Kalenhad as one of their own who had achieved the impossible, and trade opened up with many outside lands for the first time in Ferelden's existence. But as with many such golden ages, it was not to last. Then chapter 3. Galen Hart's legend tells that Lady Shaina harbored a law for her king that went beyond friendship, a law that she had kept secret out of her sense of duty and honor. When offered a law of potion by a witch in disguise, a witch who would later turn out to be the vengeance-seeking sister of all Simeon, Lady Shaina gave in to temptation. She used the potion on Galen Hart, but Queen Mary discovered the two of them together that night, and, broken-hearted, fled Denerim to return to her father. She told Murtin everything, and he angrily threatened to revoke his support of Kalenthat and begin anew the civil war. It is said that Lady Shaina felt remorseful at her manipulation of her best friend's heart and confessed her use of forbidden magic to the court. Although her life was for fate, Kalenthat forgave Lady Shaina for what she had done and refused to have her executed. Murtin furiously rose the other alls against Kalenhad and Lady Shaina, and it was not long before Ferelden stood on the brink of civil war once, once again. Against Kalenhad's orders, Lady Shaina went alone to Marin to plead for peace and plead her case, only to be found out by Murtin and slain. Angered but also saddened, Kalenhad challenged Murtin to an honor duel, a fight neither of them wanted but both knew was necessary, and Murtin was slain. The death of the king's greatest ally, an important all, was too much for the young kingdom to bear, and the other alls would not back down in their claims against Kalenhat. The threat of civil war rose once again. Kalenhat went to his wife one last time, then, although none know what he said to her, and then he simply vanished. He left with Marin, 
a proclamation abdicating his throne in favor of the son his queen carried in her belly, who eventually ascended to the throne as King Valen I. King Valen I, I guess I could say. The king credited with establishing the Darin dynasty lasting to this day. Galenhant would never reappear. The legend of Galenhart himself only grew over time as stories and sightings multiplied, even long after the point when Galenhart could possibly still be alive. Some say he disappeared into the Gorkari wilds, or went to live with the dwarves, or even became a monk in a reclusive Chantry order. The Chantry named Galenhart one of the anointed in the 788 storm. Galenhart's ward, Nemetos was left with Meireen and became a symbol of Ferelden's kingship over the next century. Rumors of its magical power grew, and when it was lost in the ambush that killed King Venetrin in 824 Plest, it was seen as a great blow to the Therian line. Several false wards have appeared since that time, but never has the true sword resurfaced. I wonder if we one day will find that sword. One in some game or another. Do I want to read about the history of the Chantry then, on the other hand? It is like there's so many of these to read though, that I don't think I'll ever read all of them, <laughs> but at least some stuff, at least some stuff. Ah, wish I had the Arlat and stuff, but I don't. Sure, let's read the history of Ferel then, chapter 1. It's kind of a good continuation, I'd say. Ferelten, as we think of it now, did not exist before the Exalted Age. Instead, the valley was divided up into dozens of old Almari clans. They warred constantly with one another over land, honor, the allegiance of the freeholders, and on one notable occasion the name given to a favorite Mapari. And then, in the 23rd year of the Exalted Age, Kalenthat Therin became a turn of Denerim, and everything changed. Most of what we know about the founding of our nation comes from the old songs that the bards passed down through the ages. The songs are filled with wild exaggerations and outright lies, but this hardly differs from the scholarly papers of some of my contemporaries. There is no agreement among poets or scholars on how he did it. But Galen had gained the support of a circle of Machai, and they crafted for him a suite of silvery white armor that by all accounts repelled both arrows and plate. Galenhard led his army across the valley and captured Redcliffe, one of only three men who ever successfully laid siege to that fortress, and presented himself to the bands of the landsmith as their king. The poets tell us that the every lord knelt before Galenhard without question. The fact that he attended the landsmith surrounded by ash warriors and loyal mages of the circle is generally omitted from the ballads, however. From Kalenhat came the line of daring kings and queens who reigned uninterrupted until the 44th year of the Blessed Age, when the Olysian invasion came. The rightful king was forced to flee Denarim, and for 70 years a puppet sat upon the throne. Then chapter 2. The occupation was a dark blot on Ferelden's history. Our people, who from the immemor immemorial valued their freedom over all else, were forced to bow to Orlesian rule. The Empire declared our elves property and sold them like cattle. Chevaliers routinely plundered freeholds of, co of coin, food and even women and children and execute excused it as taxation. And for 70 years no landsmeets were held for the imperial throne had declared our ancient laws a form of treason. Treason. King Prandel was one of those who escaped. He tried to organize the other fugitive lords to retake their lands, but Prandel was neither clever nor persuasive, and the nobles preferred to take their chances alone. Ferelden might still be little more than a territory of the empire, were it not for the fact that his daughter had all the charisma that her royal father lacked. The rebel queen's rule began with the midnight attack on the imperial armory at Lotharin. It was swift and successful, and with their pilfered arms, the rebels began to campaign against the Orlesians in earnest. But the turning point of the war came when a young freeholder joined the queen's army. The lad, Locaine Mactir, possessed a remarkable talent for strategy, and quickly became the favorite advisor of young Prince Marik. The queen finally died at the hands of the Orlesian sympathizers, 
anxious to curry favor with their painted masters, and Marik took her place as the leader of the rebellion. Locaine became Marik's right hand. Marik and Locaine led the rebels in a new campaign against their Olnesian oppressors, culminating in the Battle of River Dane, where the last chevaliers in Denarium were crushed. With the capital once more in the hands of Ferelbens, the battle to free our people was finally over, but the battle to rebuild what had been lost had only just begun. Indeed. Well, there's a good text immediately about the Orlesian Empire. <laughs> I guess we could read it. Why not? There are many lords and ladies in Val Royax, and I mean it this literally. Once the system of noble titles in Orles was uh, Laparantine, there were barons and parones and parnets and sir barons and a horde of others, each with its own origin and its own nuances of comparison. And the Orlesian aristocracy is ancient and much given to competition. All the nobility play the grand game, as it is known, whether they wish to or not. It is a game of reputation and patronage, where moves are made with rumors and scandal is the chief weapon. No gentle game, this. Moral blood has been drawn as a result of the grand game that any war the Orleans have fought. Of this I am assured by almost every gentleman here. As far as the titles went, everything changed with the coming of Emperor Dragon, who established the Orlesian Empire as it exists now, and who created the Chantry. There is no more venerated figure in Orlais in Valeroyax. The statue of Dragon stands as tall as the statue of Antraste. Dragon determined that the grand game was tearing Orlais apart, so he abolished all titles besides his own and Lord and Lady. I am told, with some twittering amusement, that this action did not end the grand game as Dragon had intended. Now the lords and ladies collected unofficial titles rather than official ones, such as the Exalted Patron of Tassus Clay, or Uncle to the Champions of Tremes. It is a headache to remember such titles, and one winches to think of the poor doormen at the balls who must rattle them off as guests enter the room. The aristocracy is different from Feralben in other ways as well. The Olysians' right to rule stem directly from the Maker. There exists neither the concept of rule by merit, nor the slightest notion of rebellion. If one is not noble, one aspires to be, or at least aspires to be in a good crisis of a noble, and is ever watching for a way to enter the patrons of those better placed in the grand game. And then there are the masks, and the cosmetics, I have not seen so much paint since the kennels at High Ever, but that is another story. Alright. Definitely different, I'd say. There is so much to read. I guess we could read about the old gods and about the blight a little bit more too, because we did start with the first blight. So, here are the ones. The old gods do not the Dragon of Silence, who was the first blight. I wonder if they are then in order. Zazigel, the Dragon of Chaos. Thoth, the Dragon of Fire. Andoral, the Dragon of Slaves. Urtemiel, the Dragon of Beauty. Razigale, the Dragon of Mystery. Lusakan, the Dragon of Night. There were seven old gods, great winged dragons that were said to rule over the ancient world. The Chantry maintains that they are responsible for the original sin, that they turned humanity away from its true creator through deceit. Humanity's weight faltered and thus the Maker turned away from the world, but not before trapping the old gods in eternal prisons beneath the earth as punishment. Scholars assume that the old gods must indeed have been real at one point, but most agree that they were likely actual dragons, ancient high dragons of a magnitude not known today, and impressive enough to frighten ancient peoples into worshipping them. Some even claim that these dragons lumber as a form of hibernation, not as a result of Maker's frat. Regardless of the truth, legend maintains that even from their underground prisons the old gods were able to whisper into the minds of men. The Archon Talzian, first of the magisters who claimed to have conducted the old god Dumat, used the blood magic Dumat taught to him to attain incredible power in the winter and declare himself the ruler of an empire. 
In Ratoon, he established the first Templars worshipping the old gods, and the dragons became equated everywhere with imperial power. To date, four of the old gods are said to have risen as corrupted archdemons. Dumat, the first and most powerful, was slain at the Battle of Silent Fields. Sazigel fell at the Battle of Stark Hafen, Dot died at the Battle of Hunter Fell, and Andoral was felled by Garehel, the legendary Grey Walton at the Battle of Ice Light. The Archdemons have been identified only after years of argument among scholars, and to this day it is unclear whether the Archdemons were truly old gods and not simply dragons. All that is known is that the Darkspawn hunt for them deep underground. If they are truly the old gods, as many scholars believe, then we have only three plights remaining. When all the old gods have risen and been slain, however, what will happen? Will the plights end forever and humanity earn forgiveness from the Maker at last? We shall see. But uh, Sasigel and the last one was Andoral, right? So yeah, then it is exactly the four first one. Dumat, Sasigel, taught Andoral and maybe now was Urtemiel indeed the Dragon of Beauty then. Dragon of Slays, Fire, Chaos, Silence have been done, and Mystery and Night would remain, if that would be the case. About the Blights. My dear Annika, I would not worry about the assembly. Let the nobles sit together and argue over those house, whose house owns the grandest hike. It keeps them from panicking, which they would surely do otherwise, and prevent them from making a great nuisance of themselves. War is the business of warriors. I would say that the enemy's strategy seemed to be changing, but they never appeared to have a strategy before beyond destroying everything in their path. For weeks their numbers appeared to be dwindling. There was talk that perhaps we were getting close to wiping them out. We could not have been more wrong, for today we come upon the body of their main force. I cannot give words to it, Annika. I have never before seen so much death in one place. There were darkspawn beyond counting, and at the heart of the throng, a great beast as tall as the palace of Osamar, with breath of fire. A baragon of darkspawn, perhaps, for they seem to pay it deference. Interesting, so this is actually some dwarf a long time ago who has seen the archdemon even. So that's interesting. Clearly a dwarf. They were leaving, marching towards the mine shafts which lead to the surface. But I knew when I beheld them that once they have devoured what lies above us, they will be back. From the letters of Paragon Eiduken, interesting. Indeed, Paragon Eiduken, the one first uh, Eiduken, even. Darkspawn. The surfaces claim that the first Darkspawn fell from heaven. They spin tales of magic and sin, but the children of the stone know better. The Darkspawn rose up out of the earth. For it was in the deep roads they first appeared. Creatures in our own likeness, armed and armored, but with no more intelligence than this badam, bestial and savage. At first they were few, easily hunted and slain by our warriors, but in the recesses of the deep roads they grew in numbers and courage. Our distant tykes came under attack, and now it was the army, not a few warriors, being sent to deal with the creatures. Victory still came easily, though, and we thought the threat would soon be over. We were wrong. Yeah, no surprise with that, to be honest. So let's see if there is anything special from Magic and Religions I would want to be reading. Ah, so this must be one of the Elven ones, clearly, because I read most of the other ones. So let's just read this then. Virthamen, Keeper of Secrets, then, from the Elves. The twins, Falondin and Tirthamen, are the eldest children of the Elgaranan, the All Father and Mutal the Protector. The brothers were inseparable from the moment of their conception, known for their great love for each other. That is why we often speak of Falondin in one breath and Tirthamen the next. For they cannot bear to be apart, not even in our tales. When the world was young, the gods often walked the earth, and Falondin and Tirtha men were no exception. Both were delighted by the many wonders of our earth. They played with the animals, whispered to the trees, and bathed in the lakes and streams. Their days were filled with bliss, and they did not know sorrow. And then one day, while passing through the forest, Falondin and Tirtha men came across an old and sickly deer resting beneath a tree. 
Why do you sit so still, little sister? asked Valandine. Play with us, said dear Tamen. Alas, spoke the deer. I cannot, I am old, and although I wish to go to my rest, my legs can no longer carry me. Taking pity on the deer, Valentine catered her up into his arms and carried her to her rest beyond the veil. Deer Tamen tried to follow them, but the shifting grey paths beyond the veil would not let him. Separated from the first time from Valentine, Deer Tamen wandered aimlessly till he came across two ravens. You are lost, and soon you will fade, the raven named Fear said to Deer Tamen. Your brother has abandoned you, he no longer loves you, said the other, named Deceit. I am not lost, and Valentine has not abandoned me, replied Deer Tamen. He subdued the ravens and bade them carry him to Valentine. This they did, for they had been defeated and were now bound to Deer Tamen's surface. When Deer Tamen found Valentine, he found also the deer, who once again was light on her feet, for her spirit was released from her weakened body. Both Valentine and Deer Tamen rejoiced to see this. Valentine vowed that he would remain to carry all the dead to their place beyond, just as he did the deer. And Deer Tamen stayed with him, for the twins cannot bear to be apart. Ah, cool. That's a nice story. The Shad of Light, the Blight. Sure. No matter their powers, their triumphs, the mage laws of the winter were men and doomed to die. Then a voice whispered within their hearts, Shall you surrender your power to time like the beast of the fields? You are the laws of the earth, go forth to claim the empty tone of heaven and be gods. In secret they worked, magic upon magic, all their power and all their vanity they turned against the whale, until at last it gave away. Above them a river of light, before them a throne of heaven waiting, beneath their feet the footprints of the maker, and all around them echoed a vast silence. But when they took a single step towards the empty throne, a great voice cried out, shaking the very foundations of heaven and earth. And so is and so is the golden city blackened with each step you take in my hall. Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting, you have brought sin to heaven and doom upon all the world. Violently were they cast down, for no mortal may walk bodily in the realm of dreams, bearing the mark of their crime, bodies so maimed and distorted that none should see them and know them for men. Deep into the earth they fled, away from the light, in darkness eternal they searched for those who had goaded them on, until at last they found their prize, their god, their betrayer. The sleeping dragon Dumat, their taint, twisted, even the false god, and the whispers awoke at last, in pain and horror, and led them to wreak havoc upon all the nations of the world. The first blight. Yep, that's how it is. But yeah, there's uh, so many, especially this cool stuff, uh, or like um, mage-related things especially. That, yeah, that would take small eternity to try to read through. At least almost all the notes that we have uh, read through for a certainty. And uh, quite a lot of the books and songs do. Just a little bit that not. History of the Chantry kind of fits if I would be reading more of the Chantry and magic. So maybe I'll have another one where I will try to do some of that stuff then. Legion of the Steel. Sure, let's read something more from here before we end for today. I so wish I had more of the Arlatan, but I don't. Culture of Ferelden. The Ferelden's Ferel Ferel are a puzzle. As a people, they are one bad day away from reverting to barbarism. They repelled invasions from the winter during the heights of the Imperium with nothing but dogs and their own obstinate disposition. They are the coarse, willful, dirty, disorganized people who somehow gave rise to our prophet, ushered in an era of enlightenment, and toppled the greatest empire in history. There are few things you can assume safely in dealing with these people. First, they value loyalty above all things, beyond wealth, beyond power, beyond reason. Second, although they have nothing in their entire country which you are likely to think at all remarkable, they are extremely proud of their accomplishment. Third, if you insult their dogs, they are likely to declare war. 
And finally, the sure sign that you have underestimated the Feraldans is that you think you have come to understand them. Okay. Then Geography of the Ferelden. The Kingdom of Ferelden is the southernmost civilized nation in Tidas, although some scholars dispute that claim to civilization. It is perhaps the most physically isolated of all the kingdoms of Tidas. To the east is the Armorantian Ocean, to the north the Waken Sea, and to the south the Gorgari Wilds, which in the summer months are a vast peat bog. Peat bog? and in the winter become a treacherous labyrinth of ice over waterways. The Frostbat Mountains guard the western border, and only narrow plain between the mountains and the sea allows travel between Feral and Aurora Lace. Most of the land in the central portion of the kingdom called the Banorn is open plains. These are crossed by the remnants of an ancient winter highway that once connected Val Royax with Ostagar on the edge of the Gorgari Wilds. The western part of Ferelden is dominated by Lake Kalenhat, a huge caldera filled by the runoff of glaciers from nearby mountains. Lake Kalenhat is home to the famed fortress of Redcliffe, as well as the Circle Tower, which houses Ferelden's Circle of Machai. In the east is the vast Brachilian forest, which the superstitious locals profess to be haunted, and from which rises the Dragon's Peak, a solitary mountain that guards the capital city of Denerim. Okay, maybe now it's uh, not as noisy outside, so I'll actually read this politics of Ferelden. To our neighbors, Ferelden seemed utterly chaotic. Unlike other monarchies, power does not descend from our throne. Rather, it rises from the support of the freeholders. Each freehold, Cahoots, <laughs> chooses the ban or arl to whom it pays allegiance. Typically, this choice is based on proximity of the freehold to the Lord's castle, as it's worthless to pay for the upkeep of soldiers who will arrive at your land too late to defend it. For the most part, each generation of freeholders casts its lot with the same ban as their fathers did. But things can and do change. No formal oaths are sworn, and it is not unheard of, especially in the prickly central Panorn, for pans to court freeholders away from their neighbors, a practice which inevitably begets feuds that last for ages. Dern arose from amongst the bands far leaders who, in antiquity, had grown powerful enough to move other bands to swear fealty to them. There were many turns in the days before King Kalenhat, but he succeeded in whittling them down to only two, Quarren in the south, however in the north. These turns still hold the oaths of bands and oaths whom they may call upon in the event of war or disaster, and similarly the turns still hold responsibility for defending those sworn to them. The oaths were established by the turns, given command of strategic fortresses that could not be overseen by the turns themselves. Unlike the Terns, the Oz have no bands sworn to them and are simply somewhat more prestigious, prestigious bands. The king is, in essence, the most powerful of the Terns. Although Denerim was originally the Terran of the king, it has since been reduced to an Arling. As the king's domain is now all of Ferelden, but even the king's power must come from the bands. Nowhere is this more evident than during the Landsmeet, an annual council for which all the nobles of Ferald and Catter held for almost 3,000 years except odd interruptions during plights and invasions. The sight of a king asking for, and working to win, the support of lesser men is a source of constant wonder to foreign ambassadors. It is definitely different than in some of the other locations well, from what we have understood thus far for sure. But yeah, I think that's enough reading for the moment, especially when there's been some extra noises from outside and all that. So it's a little bit annoying to read when there's too much loud noises. But okay, we'll read some more some other time. But that's it for now. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And uh, next time, Dark Swan Chronicles. And after that, the Draconate's Awakening. So see you then. Bye bye. To be continued with Kidarusha next time in Dragon Age.